Hey, everybody. Welcome as you're starting to join us here for our uh, first Wednesday. Uh, as always, feel free to use the chat to your advantage. Um, or if you have questions, you know, we decided to do a regular format again instead of a, a webinar format. So you can uh, jump in and, and uh, ask us anything if, if you'd like. So we're glad you're here. Um, I know some of you have already started school, my goodness. Some of you are getting ready to start next week, I think, uh, kind of uh, different all over the country, but uh, here we go. So uh, we wanted to do a little back to school, um, a little back to school insight, a little back to school inspiration from, uh, we just happen to have some guy that shows up you know, in our company every once in a while that can kind of do these things. So, um, you know, the thing about Tim is he was really readily available for a year and a half. Man, he was doing, you know, five and six of these a day. Now he's back on the road. So we got to catch him at the right time. So, um, boy, uh, Dr. Tim Watsonheiser, Tim, thank you so much for being here. Um, if every You, you went on mute. Rick, you're on mute. Oh, how did that happen? I didn't even touch anything. Somebody mute, somebody muted me. Oh, that was probably best. You probably muted everybody. One. All right. So what I was saying is thank you for muting yourself. Uh, and uh, we're so glad to have Tim. So Tim, it's all yours. Thank you for being here. Well, yeah, thanks, Rick. And, and thank everybody else for being here, too. I mean, this was great. Um, the wheels are turning. Uh, and I know Rick and I, we what was last week or two weeks ago, we've been at a couple conferences. And as I told the people there, I said, I think people would come to a conference right now if there weren't any clinics or concerts. They're just so jazzed to be back together again. And so, uh, yeah, it's good. And where was I yesterday? Tampa. And all the teachers are roaring and, and the kids particularly, oh my God, the kids are eager to come back. I was sharing with, uh, and then I'm gonna throw this back at you, Rick. I was sharing uh, with the crew the other day, Rick knows this story really well. I was doing a principal's leadership conference and they had taken a survey of which classes held the kids the best, you know, which subject matters held the kids the best during this whole uh, partially online hybrid, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, music was first by a long shot. Uh, and then they went on to discuss that and decided that the reason was because music was not a class, it was a culture. And I think that's something that all of us have taken for granted forever. I mean, it's just like, yeah, you know, that's our landscape. That's where we hang out. And most of us are here because we were part of that culture at one time and perpetuated it by going into uh, to being music teachers. So, uh, it, and I don't want to spin the pandemic to be something positive because it's a mess. However, the administrators are waking up to like, whoa, why do those kids want to come back so bad? What is it? Why don't they, what, what was the, what one principal said, you know, they have jackets and they have shirts with all that stuff on it. And he goes, you think that would work for trigonometry? I'm like, no, probably not. Probably not. So anyway, that's that's what I've been doing, Rick. Yeah, that's uh, Tim. Thanks. And, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, we all just want to we all want to think that we're going back to normal. You know, uh, every everybody that we talk to, uh, I've been in uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Little Rock and San Antonio, and everybody just keeps saying we we think it's we think we're going back to normal. We think we're going back to normal, and I agree with you, Tim. People just wanted to see each other. They're just so excited to see each other. So, um, from from your travels here most recently, uh, what are you seeing going on out there? I got a great story. <laughs> this one just came up. And I know, I know that uh, uh, most of the people on here, you are responsible uh, for giving information to other teachers. So 
<clears throat> one of the things that's come up during all this is that a lot of the high school teachers are using their student leaders to recruit, right? They're sending them out to get to the sixth graders or whatever it is. So this, now this is a Catholic school that happens. So there's a little bit of different twist here, but the guy's a great, he's, he's, he's a great band director. And so he called me to share this story uh, with the idea that I wouldn't share it with anybody. So it's mask, you don't, you know what it is. So here's the scoop. He, he and his family were, were, had plans for the summer. Then the pandemic came and then he's like, no, we're gonna cancel. And, and the school people said, no, you go, we'll take care of recruiting. And, and, the, and the elementary and the middle school and the high school are all together. It's in one big conglomerate, right? So he said he came back and the kids from his band said, you know, uh, Mr. So forth uh, on Friday night, come to the school at seven o'clock for a concert. He's like, what? So he and his wife go to this concert and he said, as he's walking in, he sees all these parents with young people and they all, all these kids have the same t-shirt on. I'm gonna be a proud member of the Bison High School Band someday or something like this. <clears throat> they go into the courtyard. There's um, a concert band set up there, right? And of course, they're not there. It's just the chairs and the stands and so forth. And he said, these people just keep coming in with these kids, right? So seven o'clock sharp, the percussion section. Now, it wasn't the full band. This is part of the band. Percussion section gets in the back. And he said, they start playing a cadence, right? And from the back, here comes like 30 kids from the band. They got all their band shirts on. And they march through in this little parade. And they get in their sections and the concert band set up. And then they play strike up the band, which I just think is pretty hip that these kids figured this out, right? Now, I'm sure some of the sisters helped along the way. You know, that's cool. So anyway, after they played, then a couple kids like got up and did testimonials. This is what band's done for me. Now, understand, out in the audience are all these going to be's that, that the high school kids have helped recruit and their parents, right? Plus all the parents of the kids that are playing, all right? So then after that, I, I, I don't, I can't remember the exact program, but then they played like uh, the, the, the alma mater. Well, most of the people there know the school alma mater. So they're all singing. And he said, I'm looking around going, why didn't I think of this? So it, now it gets really cool. So the next kid gets up and said, we have a special guest artist that's going to be a soloist with this next piece. And it was one of the policeman in town who had been a percussionist when he was in high school and he comes up with all of his gear on and you know his guns and his thing he hits people with and they pull the bass drum out in front and they play a little march and he was the soloist with the bass drum so bob said that got a standing ovation so then they played some i think it was like america or something now this is where it's really cool you talk about kids having great ideas he said, one of the senior girls that, who's really articulate got up and she said, would all the young people come up and get with their sections? Now they've already got this planned out. So all the little kids that have their t-shirts on come up and all the flutes stand together and all the clarinets stand together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then this high school girl said, this is our finale. And we wanted to get the very best, I'll cry if I talk about this. We wanted to get the very best band director in the world to conduct our finale. And we looked for one that was caring and sharing and thought about us and our program. And he said she was about halfway through before he realized it was him. And then she finishes and walks over and hands him the baton. And of course, every Catholic school's fight song, right, is the Notre Dame Victory March. And so he comes up and kicks it off. And they taught the little, the young kids who still weren't in the band yet, they were just going to be in the band, all the cheers that go in the center, right? Then they said, please, everybody come in the cafeteria. Uh, and they had like all the baked goods up the parents had made and meet the greatest band director in the world. And he said it was like a reception line at a wedding. Now, all those new parents met him. Then after that, like the parents of the older kids got the parents of the younger kids and they're all the kids got together and they took photos of them so they could send pictures of them all together his recruitment's going to be off the chart 
isn't that just neat how they did it? So that's that's my story. And like like I said, when when they when they said the greatest band director in the world, and they started talking about him, if that had been me, I'd have been a puddle. I could have never got up there. So there's the human interest aspect of what's going on out there. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. You know, Tim, you said a number of times, parents, 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 and you know, when we talk about advocacy. Um, I think we tend to set, we talk about advocacy in terms of what do we have to convince our administrators of doing for us to make our program stronger. But I think especially, unfortunately, with what we might see happening here in the near future with this variant, COVID variant, and starting to maybe make people think twice about things, um, I, I think sometimes we don't advocate enough to our parents and we don't, we don't uh, we don't uh, in, in, uh, educate our parents and maybe what they need to know that they're not getting that same information from other people in the schools, like counselors. You know, I, some counselors were some of my best friends, but they always didn't always give what I thought was the best information because they'd say, oh, you know, you need to drop band or choir or whatever in your senior year so that you can go take X, Y, Z. Uh, where X, Y, Z might not have been nearly as helpful as staying in, in their fine arts course that, that last year. So at making sure that we're letting parents know the importance of being involved in these activities, I think is super important too, wouldn't you? Well, well you're right, Rick. And, 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 and I know a bunch of you are parents and Andrea and I don't have any children, but I know a bunch of you are parents. And every time I talk to parents, the most important thing to parents is the success of their child, the success and happiness of their child. They would give up a vital organ if it would mean their child would move on to success. And there's nobody in this, you can't read that advocacy stuff and not insist your child be in music because of what it does. Now, I don't want them there for that. I want them there so they can play La Fiesta and Hindemith and all that stuff. But we can't teach them unless their butt's in the seat. And if we get that information we're given to parents, where parents going, oh my God, what do you mean? The highest rate entrance to medical school? Are you kidding me? My kids stay in the music because sometimes the kids will opt out and the parents will just give way with it and go, oh, okay, I don't want to argue with it. Instead of no, you're going to finish what you started because you're worth it. So I think you're, now, having, you're spot on. You're spot on. You, you shared something at, at one of the conferences I've heard you at recently about Johns Hopkins and, uh, the the in, interview yeah um in fact i got this from frank troika <coughs> excuse me um oh he didn't know anything <laughs> that john hopkins university uh, arguably the best medical school in the world harvard will argue with them but they're both great um when they finally vet down uh rick and everybody that's here it's good to see leslie and, and i saw rob and this is like homecoming joe's there and Good grief, Mark's over there. So anyway, when, when they get down to the final interview, the last question they ask them in the interview, John Hopkins, the medical school, is, did you sing or play an instrument when you were in high school? Well, what does that have to do with? Because they know that the habits that are created to succeed in a musical organization are the same ones the kids transplant on everything else. You know, they always go, all the smart kids are in music. No, no, they make better grades because they're using more of their mind because of what we're teaching them in music. It's it's mapping that mind. So, you know, we're yeah. selling the best thing in the world, success. Well, and this is supposed to be about hearing from you, but I'm going to throw something in here as well. Uh, similar kind of, so one of those things that parents need to be aware of. Um, there was a district is a district in, in Texas, pretty affluent district. And ver I verified this story with, with all that, that were involved. And so apparently there were two kids uh, at this school that both wanted to go to Stanford and Stanford's acceptance rate is like 5%. So they can be very, very picky, right? And one was destined to be the valedictorian and the other had already been selected uh, as a junior to be the drum major his senior year. So they both applied for Stanford. The, the young man who was destined to be the valedictorian dropped band. And why would he have dropped band, do you think, his senior year? You know, got to get his grade point up. 
right? Got to take yeah. those take away because I got to guarantee away, yeah. if I'm going to be in Stanford, I've got to guarantee my spot here. Right. So they both applied and the young man who was the drum major got accepted. The other young man did not. Parents were pretty furious. They would question it, talk to the counselor, the counselor called Stanford. Stanford apparently tells them, well, the young man that was the, the drum major had a more well-rounded, you know, sort of bi biography, if you will, or package. And uh, the fact that the other student dropped band his senior year showed a lack of commitment. And the quote was, we don't want people with a lack of commitment coming to Stanford. So those, again, continue to be the kinds of stories that we need to tell parents just to say, don't, don't be, don't, you have to help your kids over this hump. And, and we may have a new hump that we have to get over here in the next couple of months. Tell them what you just told me about what you heard in, in Georgia. Um, they started school and they closed school. They started up and spread of the thing and the, the, there, well, several schools, it wasn't just one. And they shut down band camp and they shut down this and we're going to get this cleaned up. So it's ain't over. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Tim, what, what, what advice would you give all of us to, you know, as we enter into this new school year, hoping to be back to normal, but not really, nobody has a crystal ball. We're not really sure what this is going to look like. What, 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 what kind of advice to kind of keep people their spirits up and go in the right direction. What do you think? <laughs> well, with my advice in a quarter, you can't get a Coke out of a machine. So don't, let's don't get too jazzed about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it anyway. <laughs> I think the emphasis has to be on the culture. I mean, we, we know, come on, they haven't been, they haven't had the instruments to their face or they haven't been practicing their third position on violin or singing or what. I mean, come on, that that's rusty right now. But the reason they want to come back is to be in that environment, that climate that music teachers have that no other teacher has. I mean, they, you music, oh, come on, they get you every year. They get that math teacher once or twice. They, they hang out with you. They, 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 you're their confidant, you're their uncle and aunt, and you fill all those roles. And I, you know, this is interesting, Rick, and for all of us, I mean, this is all the friends are here tonight. When people choose to be, I don't know, an architect, you choose a college that's got a great architectural school. When you become a music educator, you choose the person you want to go with. You know, you don't, you don't say I'm a IU student, you say I'm a Ray Kramer student. <laughs> and we identify with the people. So that's why you're all here, because you're heroes. And, and we're probably here because there were heroes for us. And so now everybody's looking up. This. So I think the culture is the most important thing, because that's add water, shake, and we're there, right? And it's going to take a while right. to get those chops back. Yeah, thanks. Hey, we do want to open this up uh, to anybody and everybody who would like to comment, ask a question. Um, I don't know, Beth, are you, can you, can you bring us all back up again, if you can do that? Um, I think you're, you're controlling, uh, controlling the big, the big screen so that we can all see each other. Um, all right. We should Joe, be, we should be back to normal. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's on my end that I'm only seeing a few people. Hey, Rick, uh, uh David Vandewalker's here. I, I mean, the whole parent thing, throw, throw the ball. Oh throw. yeah. 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 As a matter of fact, there's a there's a comment here by Joe Clark, um, uh, district wide fine arts parents group says anyone have theirs up and running, and would anyone like to share how it's going as we come back? Can anybody share what's happening with district parent booster groups? Well, David, the spotlight seems to be on you as the as the uh, as the you know designated expert, but uh, have you have you heard anything about what's going on? Uh, hey, thanks for um, all you guys are leading in this. I just um, 
sitting being an innocent bystander here, I thought, but no. I, well, I, so good. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so sorry about that. We just hooked you right in. It's all good. You know, we, we, we have launched the community and are getting some feedback, but it's been a little quiet at the moment because I think people are either engaged in camp or um, those who have booster clubs running are engaged in camp or getting ready for camp and launching and stuff. So I think, um, you know, the, the elements for, for those new components are probably delayed until things really get back to the full school year and they have their, their first initial district meetings and, and whatnot. But maybe I, maybe I right. missed the, the initial question, Rick, I'm sorry. No, no, I think, I think, no, you got it. It's just, is anybody, is anybody else? Have you started with anything? Are your parent groups uh, organized and, and working and moving forward already with this new school year? Any, anybody else care to share? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, David, if you have something else. No, I just say, I think a lot of the discussions I've been having, um, coaching different groups in the now, it's about, um, it kind of goes back to what Tim was saying in our goal is not to create someone to get ready for a Midwest performance right now. It's about engaging community and, and getting kids to um, rebuild that safe environment and that family nucleus, right? And so the same is exactly true for booster clubs. We need to be creating moments of opportunity to build that community and to gather again. And so, you know, based on what everybody's comfort zone is, it's, it's finding things like the tailgate party at the end of band camp or at the first home football game. It's um, let's have a potluck dinner um, at band camp and gather all of our parents and get all the trombone parents and the color guard parents at the same table again to build those relationships and start um, rekindling those relationships and finding the common ground, right? And so I heard recently um, about consider your boosters as ambassadors for your program. And I love that. Yeah. And so how can we engage folks to come together and be ambassadors in their community for what great music has um, offered their kid and their family? So to me, that's my advice that I'm, I'm trying to encourage folks that I'm working with, Rick, and that I'm hearing right now is how can we create in a short turnaround time you know, whether it's going out and finding some food trucks in our community and having some food trucks show up for uh, a, a post rehearsal performance somewhere, you know, just whatever we can do to create some now moments that we can give our parents more reason to gather and to celebrate their child and what's happening. I think one thing that was so good about what this guy did from the Catholic school I was talking about is they had both sets of parents there, the vets and the newbies. And when parents talk to parents, you're right, David, they're in the same language now. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I couldn't get my kid to take the garbage out and he'll stand out there on that marching band field for six hours to please Mr. Miller. And, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, garbage is going to get out. <laughs> Cause the parents have better, they, they have a benefit package that we don't have. And, mm -hmm. and you're right that we're not going to get to Carnegie hall this year. Or, or if we are, it's not going to sound. <laughs> but they are going to be in that culture, and they only get one shot at it. So we can't let them fall through the cracks. I'm with you, buddy. And, and you know, and I, I want to ask others about their parent stuff as well. Um, but, you know, we've heard this from a number of people, even on our Wednesday sessions or in our CSI stuff, or if you've been to any of the other conferences, whether it was Scott Edgar or Bob Morrison, it's like, it's gonna be so important whether you're in the classroom or you're monitoring people that are in the classroom, you're supervising them, that, that we uh, make sure that they know that it's okay uh, and, and maybe a better thing to just take things where they are and don't, 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 don't act like we haven't missed a year and a half of instruction, right? Like Tim said, we, we're probably not going to make it to Carnegie Hall. So let's just let's just figure out where we are, choose reasonable goals and objectives for this year, make the kids feel good. It's probably more about the community and the culture and the kids than it is anything else. But um, we just have to get our directors to understand that, I think. Well, I think for most of us, um, and, and I, I, I don't want to, 
slight the academic part of this because that's easy to do. But right now, whatever lollipops we need to keep their butts in the seat so we can get them to the, the higher level. I mean, I just think that is the most important thing in the world. And after all, it's a people business for us. You know, that's why when, right, when a director leaves, all of a sudden the program goes from 200 to 42. Well, the academic part didn't change. So that's how important that communication, constant persistence, just, you know, that's why, that's why they show the same commercial over and over and over and over. Eventually we might get it. So, you know, that's, that's, that's my goal. You just got to keep at it. You can't let, can't let go of the rings. And think about first year teachers. They've had the longest first year in the history of teaching. I think Mike, Mike Raver, I see, I, I see him on the screen here. And I think, Mike, you said that to me in Oklahoma. He, he, he went to a middle school after being at, at a university for so long. I said, how's it going? He goes, man, it's, it's, it's been the longest first year I've ever had. So uh, how, how, let's, let's I don't, again, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Too, too quickly. Uh, how about the parent stuff? Does anybody else have any any insight to what's going on with your parents that you you'd care to share with everybody else? Mark, I see you have your hand up. I do, I do. Um, Thank you for I, I raising your hand. I have a really small school. Um, I was afraid my band was going to be nine kids this year because my middle school director couldn't really say if any of his eighth graders were coming up. Turns out my last numbers I got were 12. So we have basically a pet band. But um, talking about um, the, the parents, I have three fantastic officers in my music booster club. And that's pretty much it. It's like pulling teeth trying to get other parents involved. But what I'm going to do, and this might be a strategy that some of you might want to employ, the first Tuesday night of the school year, I'm having a mandatory parent meeting for my band parents. You know, nobody's going to their house to drag them out. So how mandatory it is, is up to their interpretation. But I'm hoping that that will be the kickoff to a new, more exciting parent club is my, my motto or my slogan has been that we are rebuilding the band. And we can't do it without parents so that's that's my message to the parents i need you guys well and thank if, you if for you, sharing that if you pick up one more mark you went up 25 percent in your parent group ah that's right that's right if you, if you stand back and go you know i only got three how about the people who have zero so yeah. you, you've got a seed planet I, I admire you friend that's great thank you sorry i'm checking some people are texting as well to, with some questions and stuff. So I'm trying to keep up with both sides of that. Um, anybody else about parents? Any Anything you've experienced, Peter? So this is, isn't something we're doing in Leander ISD, but it's something that uh, Mike Mamiga did in the Richardson School District that I believe is still functioning. And you know, I, I know Rick knows about this. I'm pretty sure that Tim does because you've spoken to this group before when I was in Richardson and he got the booster club presidents from the band, high school band, choir and orchestra programs all together to meet as a group. We refer to them as the council of presidents also known by their acronym as the co of the cops. And so when we needed something, it was, we're gonna call out the cops. And you know, it's one thing when the fine arts director or whoever goes in and wants to see the superintendent about something. It's a whole other thing when, oh, we have these, because we had four, had, they still have four high schools, but yeah, these 12 uh, parents who are the president of the respective music booster clubs would like to see you. That completely changes the dynamic. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things I would love to get organized here. Although, you know, that's just kind of a slippery slope these days. I have to be careful with what I do. But I mean, if that's, that was a huge benefit to us. And that just underscores the importance of the parents being organized and all being on the same page. Yeah, I had forgotten about that. And thank you. I'm glad you brought that up and, and shared that. That sounds like a really great um, uh, 
uh, way to go to to strengthen those because then then those groups all work together. I mean, I know personally when I was a fine arts director, um, my assistant superintendent heard that parents were coming up to the board meeting about some staffing thing, and she caught me before the board meeting and she said, "What's the, what's the issue? What's the issue?" I said, "Well, they're upset because of staffing." She goes, "We'll, we'll fix that. Just tell them not to come. Tell them not to come." So you know that was just one band parent group. You know, can you imagine when? when the cops show up. I love that. I love that. Anyone else? Don't be afraid to jump in. Yeah. Hey, Rick. And, and that was, uh, and I saw David Vanderwalker come in. And I was like, hey, I almost went and got your books off my shelf here and asked the question. But that's, that's kind of the, um, when you were talking about parents, I thought that was, uh, that was perfect timing. Uh, just thinking like where we are now and where we need to move and try to get in the future like the, to represent our teachers, that parent voice, I think is, is, is killer. And, and, I, and I, I was thinking about those, just like cops, the district-wide um, community of all those presidents in that council, has anyone, like I, I almost had one started and we try to get it started and then COVID hit and, and I've been struggling. So if anybody out there has gotten one of those started, um, I would love to hear um, how, you're, how you're getting that off the ground. But I, I really think, because if we get that group together, then we can invite superintendents to say, hey, would you like to talk to our group? Oh, by the way, I know a bond is coming up. Oh, I know the, this referendum's coming up. I know this is coming up. And it, it's like a, it's an audience like already plugged in, which also satisfies a lot of those federal fund needs for like community input. So I think the more we can get those big cop groups together, um, and I'm struggling, so I'm, I'm coming hat in hand if anybody has ideas on how to get those up and running. That's kind of what I was talking about. So there was one thing I left out about this, which is that the other thing that that group does is every election season, when there's a school board election, they host a, that we, we would do a series of, uh, you know, kind of not, not meet and greets, but panel discussions of whoever the candidates were. And there would be three or four of them during the, during the election season before the election actually took place. And one of them was sponsored by the council of presidents for the, for the music booster clubs. And, you know, you can imagine the questions were just somewhat slanted to evoke what their opinions of, about the fine arts programs were. But, you know, those guys are, they're hounding for votes. And so, you know, that they're gonna, when they learn who it is that's hosting them, they're gonna be a lot better informed and the better informed they are, they're gonna have a chance to be more supportive. And then also if they don't, well, you got something to hold over them. You know, you said that you would do this and now you're not doing it. And no politician wants to hear that. Right, exactly. You know, the parents too, that, I mean, Peter, spot on. Everybody has been, this is great. I'm going to get my parent booster started. The parents for music, it's so much different. And I know they go, well, you know, the athletics has parents. The athletic parents sit and watch. Our parents do. They're part of the fabric of the program. They're doing stuff. And I've had so many directors go, you know, I think they would rather, I think the dads would rather be at a booster meeting than at home mowing the yard because they're all their buddies are there. So it's a, it's a culture within a culture. So sip. Yeah. Hey, Tim, tell the story about the, the band parent that was on the field moving equipment and then you found out who he was. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that story has been around for a while. It's a, a legend. Um, uh, and it was in Houston. Yeah, it's 170,000 degrees and you could cut the humidity. And this poor dad didn't know he was trying to set the timpani up and he didn't know what he was doing. He was, he was in a, a mess. And I'm like, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And we got it all set. And I told him to stand back and just, you know, watch his son. And I went over and the band director said, you know who you're talking to? And I said, yeah, it's one of your band dads. He said, no, I said, that's Lieutenant Colonel Lindsay. He's the next captain in the shuttle going up. The guy was an astronaut, so <laughs> he didn't know where to put the drum. So <laughs> when it was done, I, I ran back over to get his autograph. It's just the sweetest guy in the world. And a couple of the other dads were astronauts too that were there. And I said, what are you doing out here? You know, we got a lot of money invested in you, pal. And he said, and it was, it was just tears in his eyes. He goes, I'm doing the most important thing in my life. I'm supporting my kid. The most important thing in his life was not flying to the moon. It was supporting his son. And I mean, too, mind blowing. And we've got that. We've got that card, that wild card to play. We just, we need to play it. Yeah, Peter was right. 
Yep. Yep. Hey, switching gears just a little bit um, back to, you know, Tim made the comment of, uh, you know, some schools closing because of what's going on. Uh, what's the status of schools in your area right now? We kind of talked about this last month and we said we would kind of revisit that again just to kind of get a feel. Does anybody have anything, um, you know, definite that, you know, districts have said, this is what we're doing, X, Y, Z? I know uh, basically what I've been getting from everybody that I've asked is we think we're going back to normal. And I'm asking questions like, are, are your kids going to have to be vaccinated? And, you know, uh, and most people say, oh, our school district's not ready to go down that road yet and try to, you know, defend that. But kind of just in general, what, what, what's happening out there? Can we hear from a couple of you? Don't be afraid. Well, we're from Texas, so <laughs> we're open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we can't mandate anything at this moment, so uh, nor can we check any vaccination. So we're open and I'm, so I'm sort of excited. No, uh, no masks. They can if they want to. Yeah. 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 We have an interesting thing happening. Uh, I'm in Houston as well. And so I was just telling Tim earlier, our, our mayor has uh, uh, mandated that all city employees wear masks now. Uh, and our governor says you can't mandate any masks. And so there's all this, yes, we can. No, you can't. Yes, we can. No, you can't. So who knows what's, what's going to happen. Anybody else have anything specific that maybe their districts are doing that you'd like to share oh some, i see oh i got my there are go some ahead. interesting comments in the uh in the chat section i was just i just hit my chat box was hidden uh so um hey corinne nice to see you. thanks for being here um mask required indoors bell covers required for brass and woodlands three foot physical distancing in vancouver washington thanks uh robert rudy who happens to be my high school band director and so i can i can say robert rudy but i can only say hi mr rudy um uh where'd your comment go now uh state says no mask required but several districts are ignoring that and requiring everyone to mask from arizona Okay, um, I live in a place much like Texas. Oh, Trish from Canada. Uh, we don't get back for about three weeks. Uh, here's uh, Rose says, uh, just confirmed, uh, Illinois just confirmed mask indoors, three foot distancing, but back to normal full schedule. Uh, Alberta as of August 16th, free of masks and everything. So yeah, that's that's, kind of all over the place, isn't it? Oh, Mike says, Mike Raver just found out today that we are back to class as normal with some social distancing requirements. So um, uh, are, is anybody gonna be required to do the shields and all that kind of stuff or just mainly masks, I guess, huh? So we, we're, we have mounds of fiberglass just sitting around everybody's school district somewhere. I don't know what everybody's gonna do with it, but yeah. Well if you know we're teachers we're going to err on the side of safety absolutely and and we should i mean those kids love us and it's time to love them back and make sure they're safe so that's that's my two cents worth yeah um okay looking at a couple minutes oh wow this is interesting 30 minutes of uh from serena 30 minutes of playing time max social distancing uh, we need to clear the room, makes it in public buildings. We start back September 7th. Interesting. Serena, where, where are you from? Can you just, you can just unmute if you want to. I was just curious. Oh, Halifax. Oh, Canada. Okay. I've been to Halifax, Nova Scotia. That's a very cool place, especially the lobster. Oh, shields are, are in the way of air circulation. Yep. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for all those. Thank you for all those comments. Just good, good, good to hear them. Uh, hey, get a sense of what's going on. Yes. So we're in central Michigan and not a lot of guidance from the CDC, but, um, we rescheduled a trip to New York city for October because we had to cancel it back in last March. And, uh, 
again, rural Michigan. So we were probably 50 to 60% vaccinated. And now it's looking like New York City performance venues are going to require vaccinations. So now uh, I have to figure out another complication if you're taking trips to think about is now I, I just emailed our rep to see what, what this actually means for the performance venue we're going to. Um, and so that should be interesting to, uh, to work through how we, how we handle that as we travel. Thanks, Jim. Jim. That's, a, that's a really great thought. Jim, did you just say New York was going to require vaccinations for everybody traveling? Yeah, from what I've heard, indoor dining and, and some or most performance venues are now, and I don't, we don't have a lot of guidance as to what that's going to look like. You know, I mean, and for, I'm for sure vaccination cards will be sold on eBay pretty soon, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yes, supposedly that's what's going on. Um, New York City, yes, not the state. New York City has supposedly uh, implemented that. And so, so yeah, um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see how that works out. Jim, what's what's happening in Michigan, state-wise? State Normally, we're in we're in Central Michigan, so typically, what happens is the CDC makes recommendations, and our health department adopts them, and then our school district, within reason, follows those. Um, we're a relatively small. I had about uh, thirty-eight kids in person, and I had enough room in my auditorium to distance them, so we played every day, uh, which was just amazing. Uh, now, my seventh-grade trombone players were about forty-five or fifty feet away from me. That was a little challenging. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but it's, it's been great. And we, we take reasonable precautions. Um, kids are kids, you know, masks are down a lot. And, uh, we had vaccination clinics for the students when it was available and we had very few kind of show up. So, um, you know, but we don't, we don't know right now. I think again, CDC made those recommend new recommendations. Typically what happens is several weeks after that, the health department then adopts what they do for our County and then our return to learn plan, which I'm not sure if that's in place still or not usually says we will follow health department uh, and CDC guidelines. So we'll, we'll see nothing from the soup yet on that though. Right, right. Thank you for sharing. And, and again, I would like to encourage all of you as, you as you hear some of these things, or if you have questions, remember we've got our Facebook page. You don't have to wait for the next month. Right. Uh, like I tell people all the time, you know, I've been down some of these, not these roads, but other roads, and I've beat my head up against the wall. Many, no sense in you doing the same thing if some of us have been through it before and we can, we can help you. So you use that Facebook page to communicate with, with each other. And, and, and if somebody on there can't get you an answer, we'll reach out to our resources. Tim happens to know a few people. We can probably, <laughs> uh, we can probably uh, find you the information uh, that you need. Yeah, Greg, elementary is scary. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no telling. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Um, yeah. Can can you pass it over to Mike so he can just before we get out of time, say a couple things about the ESSER thing? Yeah, absolutely. Mike, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. So Mike Great. Campice is our managing director in our division of education, and he has really become the, the ESSER guru of Con Selmer and uh, you know, please, there's there's so much money out there to be had. Uh, you just got to grab it. So, Mike, why don't you give us the latest and greatest what you have on, on ESSER funding right now? Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, grateful for the discussion that I've heard this evening, too. A lot of great insights from everyone. So appreciate everyone attending. Uh, I consider myself a music advocate that just happens to like um, education policy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's folks out there like Bob Morrison and Lynn Tuttle and others that I really uh, learn from and uh, just see it as our job to help make sure that everyone's informed with what's happening out there. And, uh, you know, with the ESSER fund, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, I see some of our friends from Texas who we met with a couple months back on it. Uh, you know, the funding is really starting to take shape across the country. And the funding was basically sent out in three phases. And right now we're in the midst of uh, districts and states finalizing the last of the, the third uh, pile of money that was part of this ESSER fund, this $160 billion that's being put out. And uh, there's some extensions happening in some areas where the plans have not yet been finalized in some districts and some states. So there's still time to be a part of the conversation if you haven't been yet. But uh, uh, that, that being said, I know many of you have been involved that I see on the Zoom this evening. And 
for those that haven't, uh, we're doing many consultations with uh, schools all over the country. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I know I'm booked up the next two weeks doing one-on-one -on -one consultations with folks. I know, Rick, you've been helping a lot of folks. Um, but if anyone would like to dive into the weeds more, you can email us at education at consumer.com and we'll set up a, a consultation to get you all the information that's out there. The uh, Department of Education released about a month back a document that actually lists music and arts education as part of a, the, their FAQ document of what this ESSER funding can be used for. And, uh, you know, as, as far as the overall planning, these are not something that's specific to a school, but they are district plans uh, for this ESSER funding. Uh, and I know Joe Clark and others that are on here have been deeply diving into this, but uh, uh, just know that there's a lot of money and it equals about eight times the level of Title I funding uh, that's ever been sent throughout the country for education. Uh, that's the formula they're using to send the money down to the states, which is now being uh, distributed uh, through to the districts. Uh, this funding will last through September 2024. Uh, it can be used for uh, anything from materials needed to provide education, can be used for the health and safety of the students. Uh, it can be used actually to um, help us keep music educators in their jobs over the next three years if we've seen programs that have gone down. Uh, we can give them an opportunity to get their programs back up if they had to go to virtual teaching in states like California and other places where it's, it's been a little more difficult. But uh, there's so many uh, things that can be used for, and they've left it pretty open uh, in regards to that. So I'm actually curious with those that are with us this evening, have any of you had success with ESSER funding uh, at this point, would like to kind of turn it back to everyone else, and I'll turn it back to you, Rick, just to see if there's any dialogue or discussion on ESSER funding. Has anyone seen success or, or having uh, uh, the ear of the district at this point? Thanks, Mike. You bet. Yeah, yeah. I'll, and and I'll, I'll and please, you know, come on come on on if, if you uh, have something to add but i can tell you this has been this has been kind of crazy so we we just shared with you earlier today all the places that we've been the last couple of weeks <clears throat> and i've had everything from my district's not giving me any of the funds they know that i'm eligible for it but they're using all those funds to so they didn't have to let teachers go like mike alluded to so they're not given you know not given the band programs any funds um, I've got people that still have these big, like shock looks on their faces when they find out that there's money. So I, I, I hate to say this, but I think that in some districts and typically maybe in your smaller districts, uh, either people aren't up to speed on what the laws are or what, what's going on, uh, or they know about it and they just don't want you to know about it. And so they're, they're keep kind of keeping it hush hush. So, you know, you need to get in there and be just as knowledgeable as some of those other folks in your districts that are don't want out the money. And then I had somebody else come in and say, our district is getting so much money from, from these ESSER funds that it literally has come to a standstill. They, they don't even know how to process it right now. It's just, it, we don't know how, how to, how to dole out all this money. So three very different scenarios. Um, but as Mike shared, the, the, the money is there. And anybody, uh, anybody on with us tonight have any uh, success? Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, oh, chats here. So I'll go can, through here. You want me to jump in? I'm sorry, Dr. Oh, Tim. Jeff, I'm not, I saw your hand and I'm not getting in front of Dr. Tim. Did you? No, you go, 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 Joe. Okay. Um, in Texas, we, we've we um, shared plans and resources and kind of shot them out um, centrally. And so a lot of people have given us feedback and there's a ton of money that's already gone out to um, Texas districts. Um, just from what I've heard, um, easily 80 million um, just in, in instruments, pri um, like sectionals, private lessons, master class, anything to recover from learning loss. Um, so we, we made sure that we had that in the language and we and what Mike was talking about with that FAQ, we put that at the top of our needs assessment with a link to that document. So that was like gold. And I think a lot of things opened up after that. Um, yeah. And we had a lot of finance directors say, I was at, I was the most prepared. This is El Paso, I can tell you. He said, I was the most prepared um, administrator at the table. And some of the assistant soups were sent back to revise their plans to make it look more <laughs> professional as the fine arts plan was. And that was that one was 4.9 million in ESSER funds. 
So, and, um, and, but I'll give you the other side, of the, um, the other side of the coin of that too, is Rick, you're right. Um, I met with my deputy um, uh, superintendent uh, just yesterday. And he said, like, I, you can tell he's choking from all the money and he doesn't know what to do. And he said, like, hang on, we have a plan. I let the dust settle. So even if, and I would say this to everybody, even if you don't get in on the original plan or whatever that looks like in your district, like, hang on tight, because there's so much money, it's going to fall out. And you can just just be ready and be prepared to catch it when it falls. And that's what he told me um, yesterday. He's like, just let me have your plan. Let me let me pitch it. But Texas's deadline has already passed. We already had to submit our plan for ESSER. So our plan is in, but we still use big bucket terms to where I can still go in there and get those funds. So if you're in Texas or if you miss the deadline, don't worry. Just have your plan and be prepared. Be the most prepared person at the table, uh, like El Paso, and then uh, and bring a big bucket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other the other thing too is he said make sure it aligns with your strategic plan so if you have a strategic plan in your district go grab those pillars those values the core, core values and all those drag them over to your ESSER plan and make sure it's in there too to align it I've heard a lot of people say they didn't have any luck but when the parents went in with the information all of a sudden the ears open and yesterday I was just with the music supervisor who said we just picked up seven million and I'm like, how did you get it? And he said, I asked for it with a plan that made sense. So you're spot on, Joe. Yeah, I, it's there. I, I would say too, um, I was talking to a neighboring district who was asking for some money for a bond and they had some pretty general, um, general dollar amounts, this base clarinet 2000 and up this and that. And, and I would say that, you know, your, your business officers, your superintendents, they have a lot of stuff to do. If you can make this as easy as possible, for them. We've collected three bids already. Here is the exact dollar and cent amount. Here's what the shipping will cost. Know that if it's over 25,000, some of your board policies require three competitive bids, get all that work done for them and make it. So all they have to do is go, yep, we've got that money. We're on a, our, our total district budget is 7 million. We got 125,000, 625,000. We're scheduled to get another 900,000. So there's money. And what's going to happen is, like they've said, they, they, they use pretty general terms. we got a lot of time to spend it. It's pretty vague. And so just have a spreadsheet. If you get 500 or 5,000 or 50,000, know exactly what you buy. Have that in front of them because there will be money left over. And some districts are doing bond issues as well as disaster money. So have that ready right. and know who to ask and know kindly how to ask. Know they have extra jobs. Their job is not to make you happier to build your program. That's your job. Um, but have that ready and make it as easy as possible so they can sign a check and say yes, and you'll probably get some money. That is really great advice, Jim. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, you're already at no, so you know, put put your plan together and and uh, and there's plenty of folks on here um, that can help you with that. Um, I know uh, somebody asked earlier. Um, about you know not getting any information, uh, please go on our website and and then click on the link that was put in the chat. If you want a private consultation with with one of us, um, we'll be we'll be happy to walk you through it. And then it's then obviously it's your job to you know to take it further. Now, this is going to kind of sound like I work for an instrument manufacturer, but I just I, I want to say this is there is now specific language in the law that says this money may be used to purchase musical instruments okay so don't let anybody tell you you can't do that i mean that was a big that was sort of left up to, to the interpretation uh, of the of the laws i guess and joe and those mike you guys correct me if i'm wrong but now it specifically says so um just be aware of that don't don't let them tell don't let them tell you that you can't buy musical instruments because you can yeah, that was in the same document Joe was talking about on uh, the Department of Education document. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. right. Mike, what are some of the other things that you're aware of that people have been able to use that money for? I know staffing, um, you know, supplies, including instruments. Are there, are there other things that you're aware of that would pertain to uh, uh, music education? Staffing, access and equity is a big one. I see a lot of uh, urban districts that haven't necessarily had the means to provide things for their students starting to take advantage of that because they see it as a, a huge opportunity. Uh, but the same language of Title I exists within ESSER uh, that's being taken advantage of. I think Leslie Moffitt mentioned earlier maintenance. That's been a huge piece. 
being able to clean all the instruments before the kids are back in school. Um, and obviously the, the sharing of instruments has been a big deal too, because she, the, the days of sharing a tuba with four different kids isn't necessarily <laughs> kosher in the environment that we're in right now. So uh, a lot of districts are looking at that as well. And then uh, social emotional learning has been a huge topic with ESSER. Uh, if, you, if you haven't referenced any of Dr. Scott Edgar's resources in regards to social emotional learning, uh, many districts are looking at music education as a big catalyst for that. I think it's something everyone on this Zoom probably already knew existed, but uh, it, it, he captures it in a way that I think resonates with, uh, with district leaders across the country. And uh, I think uh, a lot of districts are looking at it as a way to give kids something that is um, uh, something that's going to engage them and, and keep them going. And uh, uh, so those are those are just some of the examples. But uh, if if you have if you're not familiar with ESSER, there's 15 statutes we can arm you with that uh, is all inclusive and relates to music education. We can definitely help you out with that. Also, don't forget yeah, about don't. technology. You need a new sound yeah, yeah. projector, recording devices, totally. mics for jazz band, portable sound systems. That's easy to get. That's always applied for an ESSER too. So. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And thank you, William, for putting that in the chat, too. Yeah, folks, don't, you know, whether you're in a big school district or a small school district, and I know in, in a big school district, you tend to have a lot more resources, but don't ever feel like you're out there alone. I mean, th we're, we're music educators, right? Um, uh, you know, Tim, myself, all of our educational support managers, you know, we have 30 plus years in, in music education. And, and, you know, we've kind of learned to speak that that administrative speak too that many of you have had to learn how to deal with. But please let us help you if we can. We we don't have we don't have any magic answers, but but we can certainly help guide you and 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 talk you through some of these processes. The, uh, the most Tim, powerful we thing. got a we, go ahead. I was going to say the most I powerful gonna, thing we got is on the screen. It's us. <laughs> well, exactly. Lock it's, arms exactly and head right. forward. We've right, got it. Right. You need us. Use that. Use that Facebook page. There's there's ton of tons of stuff there for you. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let Tim have the final final words. Uh, well, actually, before I give it to Tim, uh, housekeeping. Next week, uh, we're gonna have a presentation uh, by Elisa Jansen Jones, who um, is our online learning uh, expert. And she's actually going to do some some uh, information on uh, going back to a little bit of the virtual teaching and some resources that we may have to uh, to offer to you that that might help you. Um, I hate to say that we might be going back down that direction, but just in case, we'll see what happens in a month. But she'll be on with us. Uh, you'll be able to uh, register uh, for that. Uh, thank you, Beth. Just drop the link in the chat. Uh, for next week. One thing that I did want to ask you before I turn it over to Tim, and if you could just drop this in the chat too, how does this time work for you? Um, we had many, many people sign up for this, but we tend to have a much smaller audience when it comes right down to it. So is this too early? Is it too late? You know, we're trying to accommodate people from coast to coast, plus Canada and everywhere in between. So um, if you could just Give me a little shot in the in the chat as to whether you think this is a good time or earlier or later. That would be very very helpful. Um, Tim, leave us with the greatest words. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, just thanks everybody for doing this. Beth is always a great job. Rick, you are the best at this. And Mike, thank you for jumping in, and all of you because it's it the mortar and the bricks is us. The bricks are the easy part the mortar to make it stick together. And it's the old, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And as long as we got a bunch of people chewing on that same beast at the same time, we'll get the job done. I'm just so glad to see all of you here and so proud of our profession. We're, we, we've got the best thing in the world to sell. We've got success. So thank you all. Thank you a lot. We'll send you some of this stuff too. Make sure you get it in hard copy. Rick, thanks, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. We appreciate your, your uh, contributions and go get them. <laughs>